On January 7, 1972, the life of 19-year-old Nancy Elaine Anderson came to a tragic end in her apartment, located in the vibrant neighborhood of Waikiki, Hawaii. The discovery of her lifeless body revealed a horrifying scene. She had endured a staggering 63 brutal stab wounds, with three of them inflicting severe lacerations. Initially, authorities suspected the possibility of suicide, but the gravity of her injuries quickly dispelled that notion. Thus began an extensive and convoluted investigation that would span several decades, until a significant breakthrough finally emerged in 2022. The captivating allure of Waikiki, nestled in the heart of Honolulu, the capital city of Hawaii, draws countless tourists seeking recreational activities and a blissful holiday experience. Its pristine white sand beaches captivate visitors from around the globe, while the tropical climate, enchanting landscapes, and sun-kissed shores create an ambience of perpetual vacation for the local residents. However, beyond its reputation as a paradise for vacationers, Waikiki became infamous for a chilling case that sent shockwaves through the nation in 1972. Nancy Elaine Anderson, born on November 10, 1952, to Merle Van Anderson and Thelma Bernice Brown Anderson, was known for her amiable nature and warm personality. She was raised in a large and loving household, being one of ten siblings. Born in Bay City, Bay County, Michigan, she had a strong desire to experience the island life after graduating from John Glenn High School in 1970. The thrill and adventure of living on an island had always captivated her. Before starting college, she made the decision to pursue this lifelong dream. In October 1971, she relocated to Hawaii and settled into an apartment at 2222 Alova Drive in Waikiki. She also secured a job at a McDonald's located in the Ala Moana Center. According to her roommate, Jody, Nancy was incredibly friendly and trusting of strangers. Her outgoing nature and amiable personality caused some concern among her friends, colleagues, and family. It was widely known that Nancy dated multiple men, which raised red flags for those close to the 19-year-old. However, at work, her manager, Petro Ripolio, remembered her as a dependable and friendly employee. Her co-worker, Julie Torres, believed that Nancy was not promiscuous, but simply too friendly. No one could have predicted that her friendly demeanor would lead to a tragic and merciless death. Nancy returned to her hometown in Michigan to celebrate Christmas and New Year's with her family. Unbeknownst to her, tragedy awaited her upon her return to Waikiki. It had only been two months since she had embarked on her dream life in Hawaii, but it all came to a devastating end on January 7, 1972, when she was brutally stabbed to death. On that fateful day, Jordi Spooner, Nancy's roommate, arrived home from shopping at 2.30 p.m. to find two unfamiliar men attempting to sell silverware to Nancy. Jody joined Nancy to watch their demonstration, but neither of them made a purchase. After conversing with Nancy for about 10 minutes, Jody retired to her bedroom for a nap between 2.40 and 2.50 p.m. Despite their good terms and friendly relationship, Jody preferred to keep to herself as Nancy often invited random strangers into their home. Jody had always believed that Nancy was too trusting and had a careless attitude towards her safety. Jody vividly remembers that before she took a nap, all the doors to their apartment were securely closed and locked. As she drifted off to sleep, she could faintly hear the radio playing in Nancy's bedroom and the sound of running water from her bathroom. When Jody woke up around 5.15, she headed to the kitchen and still heard the continuous noise of running water coming from Nancy's bedroom, which now had its door slightly open. Curiosity led Jody to enter the room, only to discover her roommate lying on the floor, covered in blood. Assuming it was a suicide, Jody hurriedly sought help from her neighbors to call the police. The lifeless body of the 19-year-old girl from Michigan lay motionless in a pool of blood, 
leaving everyone puzzled about how her life had come to such a tragic end. On the evening of January 7, 1972, officers Mitten Villace and George Gibbons from the Hawaii Police Department received a distressing call at approximately 5.29 p.m., reporting a possible suicide at apartment 704. 2222 Aloha Drive, Coral Terrace Apartments, Honolulu. As the police entered the apartment, they immediately noticed a blood-stained blue and white towel near the entrance. Upon entering the bedroom, they discovered Nancy lying unresponsive on the floor. Traces of blood were also found on the bed and in the bathroom. The brutal death of Nancy left everyone horrified. An ambulance was called, but unfortunately, at around 6 p.m., a physician pronounced her dead. Interestingly, while Nancy Anderson was being violently slain in her small apartment, her roommate, Jodie Spooner, who was still inside, heard nothing that would have awakened her from her nap. None of the neighbors witnessed or noticed anything out of the ordinary either. This case was truly perplexing. The police conducted an extensive search for clues, but unfortunately, there was very little evidence to work with. Detective George Cruz observed multiple puncture wounds on Nancy's sternum, chest, abdomen and thighs. Another officer noticed that her blouse was torn near her right armpit, revealing her bra. The autopsy confirmed puncture wounds on her left forearm, lacerations on her upper left arm, and blood under her fingernails. Shockingly, the autopsy report revealed that Nancy had been stabbed 60 times with a paring or pen knife, resulting in 63 wounds, including three exit wounds. The cause of Nancy's death was determined to be hemorrhage from a stabbed wound to the heart. The murder weapon was estimated to be approximately 10 millimeters wide and 60 millimeters long, but it did not match any knives found in Nancy's apartment. The autopsy report did not indicate the presence of drugs or alcohol in her body, although spermatozo were found, which could potentially be related to consensual sexual activity. The police relied on the evidence recovered from the crime scene, including a blood-stained bedspread, three towels, and two slippers to gather leads. They believed that the attack became so violent at one point that the assailant's hand slipped off the blade, resulting in a significant cut. The attacker then used a towel to wipe away excess blood. Additionally, the police suspected that the wound on Nancy's thumb may have been inflicted in self-defense. Not only was the identity of the killer unknown, but the motive behind the murder was also unclear. Nothing appeared to be missing from the house, ruling out robbery as a motive. Nancy's kind and friendly nature made it unlikely that she had any enemies. As the investigation progressed, it became increasingly challenging for the police to uncover new leads. However, they did have a few suspects, including the two salesmen, Parker Graham and Jeffrey Alward, who were the last individuals seen leaving Nancy's apartment. Consequently, they were brought in for questioning. The detailed account was provided on how they arranged a meeting with Nancy. The presentation commenced at approximately 1.30 or 1.45 p.m. However, Nancy and her roommate showed no interest in the products and were given a pie cutter before they left the premises without visiting any other location. Both Parker and Jeffrey willingly provided their fingerprints, but none of them matched the ones found at the crime scene. Their polygraph tests confirmed the accuracy of their initial statements. When this line of investigation proved fruitless, the police turned their attention to the information provided by Jody's boyfriend, Kim Weaver. According to him, Nancy would often invite strangers to her apartment and associate with peculiar-looking men. Although he didn't know their names, he had given them nicknames such as Frenchman, Reno Nevada, Cowboy and dude from Detroit. The investigators thoroughly examined these individuals and their alibis. Reno, Nevada turned out to be William Mena, who had dated Nancy, but claimed their relationship never went beyond kissing. He stated that he had never visited her apartment and had no knowledge of who could be responsible for the murder. Stephanie Fraser, 
a resident of 2223 Alawai Boulevard, which was the neighboring building to Aloha Drive, witnessed some commotion on the day of the murder. She observed a car in the upper-level parking lot where a Caucasian couple could be heard arguing. After 15 minutes, they exited the vehicle, but Stephanie couldn't determine whether they proceeded onto the street or entered the building. The male individual was described as having tan skin and being between 5'9 and 5'10 tall. He was approximately 25 years old and had dark brown curly hair. On the other hand, the woman was believed to be in her 20s and had shoulder-length dirty blonde hair. When presented with multiple pictures of potential suspects, the witness identified Richard Hacker, a mutual friend of Jody and Kim, as the man she saw arguing in the car. However, the certainty was not absolute. Subsequently, during the police investigation, one of Nancy's colleagues, named Karen Sullivan, disclosed that Nancy had mentioned dating a member of the Mafia in the past, but no substantial evidence could be found to verify this claim. In Nancy's purse, the police discovered a bank passbook from Bank of Hawaii, indicating that she had opened an account just hours before her death on January 7th. Further questioning of Paula Meyer, the bank teller, revealed that, that Nancy likely opened the account between 2.15 and 3 p.m., shortly after Paula returned from her lunch break. The police extensively interviewed neighbors, boyfriends, roommates, salesmen, property managers, colleagues, and family members, but none of the leads or suspects provided fruitful results. Consequently, the case eventually went cold. Despite this, the police department remained determined and did not give up on solving the murder of Nancy Anderson. Advancements in science and technology in recent years motivated them to delve deeper and seek new answers. Between 2001 and 2003, blood samples discovered in 1972 were utilized to create three DNA profiles, two belonging to males and one to a female. Every individual involved in the case underwent testing and was ruled out as a suspect once again. However, the fate of Nancy Anderson took a turn when the Honolulu police received a tip in December 2021 suggesting a potential connection between the murder and a 77-year-old man named Tula Churila Jr. The Honolulu Police Department conducted a DNA test on the evidence collected from the crime scene and sought assistance from Parabon Nanolabs, a DNA technology company based in Virginia. Utilizing DNA phenotyping, genetic genealogists were able to generate predictions of the suspect's physical traits as they would have appeared at the age of 25. It was discovered that Chirila resided in Reno, Nevada in 2021, prompting the Reno Police Department to be notified of this significant development in the case. Despite weeks of surveillance, their covert attempts to obtain Chirila's DNA were unsuccessful. In March 2022, they reached out to Tula Churila's biological son, John Churila, for assistance in obtaining a DNA sample. On May 5, 2022, the forensic report confirmed that John Churila's DNA sample was a match to the DNA found at the crime scene, establishing that Tula Churila, John's father, was involved in the case. Tula Churila's DNA profile aligned with the initial profiles discovered in Nancy's bedroom, marking a significant breakthrough in the long-standing cold case of Nancy Anderson. According to genetic genealogy, the suspect would have been approximately 25 years old at the time of the crime. It turns out that Tudor, who was born on April 15, 1945, would have been 27 years old in 1972 when Nancy was murdered. During that time, he worked as a graduate assistant at the University of Hawaii and resided on Canal Street, which was just three miles away from Nancy's apartment. Following her tragic death, Tudor left Hawaii and successfully completed his law degree. He then went on to serve as the Deputy Attorney General in Nevada. Notably, Tudor is recognized as a long-term attorney in the Silver State, working under the esteemed Attorney General Richard H. Bryan 
in various regions including Reno, Carson City, and Lake Tahoe. However, Tudor faced a setback in 1994 when he lost the election for the state Supreme Court of Nevada. It is worth mentioning that Tudor has been involved in several legal cases primarily related to taxation or estate matters. Interestingly, the Nancy Anderson case is not the first instance where Tudor Churula has been implicated. In 1971, he reported his car stolen and later filed a complaint stating that the contents of his car were missing upon its recovery. Additionally, in 1995, when Tudor was 50 years old, he faced a complaint accusing him of kidnapping, restraining, and attempting to assault his then-girlfriend. However, these charges were eventually dropped. Another noteworthy mention is that in 1998, Tudor's name was linked to the Mustang Ranch brothel, owned by Joseph Comfort, a prominent figure in Nevada's brothel industry. U.S. prosecutors identified Tudor as the former president of AGE Corp., which was allegedly a front for Joseph's illicit activities. They were suspected of engaging in a conspiracy to defraud the government. In 2022, justice was finally served for Nancy after a long 50 years. The first arrest in the case was made, and Tudor Churila was charged with her murder. On September 6, 2022, detectives executed a search warrant at Churila's residence and obtained his DNA sample using a buckle swab. Merely two days later, Tudor made a suicide attempt, but fortunately he survived. The results of the DNA test allegedly linked Tudor to Nancy Anderson's murder. Following this confirmation, a non-bailable arrest warrant was issued, and Tudor Chirila Jr. was finally taken into police custody for the fatal killing of Nancy. He was initially held at Washoe County Jail in Reno, Nevada, and later extradited to Honolulu. In Honolulu, he pleaded not guilty to the charge of second-degree murder. His bail has been set at $1 million. While further trials are pending in the case, the investigation remains active and ongoing. Despite the passage of 50 years, the Anderson family never lost hope, and the police department never forgot the brutal murder of the young 19-year-old Nancy Elaine Anderson. With the arrest of a confirmed suspect, justice for Nancy is now within reach. Thanks to advancements in technology and genetic genealogy, the identity of the killer, who had mercilessly stabbed her over 60 times, has finally been revealed. As for the possible motive behind the killing, it remains a question. Do you believe there could have been other individuals involved in the murder of Nancy Anderson? On September 12, 1988, Lawrence, Massachusetts, was rocked to its core by a tragic event. The lifeless body of an 11-year-old girl named Melissa Tremblay was discovered brutally stabbed to death and abandoned on the train tracks near the Boston and Main Railway Yard. This senseless act of violence left the community in a state of shock, anger, and profound sadness. The question on everyone's mind was, who could commit such a heinous act. The search for justice would span 35 years before the perpetrator was finally apprehended. Nestled along the picturesque banks of the Merrimack River, Lawrence is a vibrant and thriving city that seamlessly blends small-town charm with the excitement of a bustling metropolis. The heartbeat of the city is fueled by its diverse and passionate residents, whose unwavering pride and love for their community can be felt in every corner. As you stroll through the bustling streets of Lawrence, a palpable sense of history and heritage permeates the air, as if the very bricks and stones whisper tales of the past. Lawrence holds a significant place in American labor history, as it was here that the historic Bread and Roses strike of 1912 unfolded marking a turning point in the fight for workers' rights and social justice. However, amidst this rich tapestry of history, tragedy struck in 1988. Melissa Tremblay, born in 1977 to her mother Janet Tremblay in Salem, Massachusetts, fell victim to a horrific crime. Raised by her single mother, Janet Melissa, 
affectionately known as Missy, attended Lancaster School and was adored by her peers. Described as a carefree, fun-loving and compassionate little girl, she had a wide circle of friends and always brought joy to those around her. Melissa's favorite playground was the Boston and Main Railway Yard, where she would spend countless hours running and playing amidst the train tracks while her mother visited friends at a nearby social club. Tragically, it was in this very place that her life was cut short, forever altering the lives of those who loved her. On September 11, 1988, Melissa accompanied her mother and her boyfriend to the La Salle Social Club in Lawrence, not far from the railway. While the adults stayed inside, Melissa went outside to play. The last sightings of her alive were reported by a railroad employee and a pizza delivery driver who were in the vicinity during the late afternoon hours of that day. When Janet realized her daughter was missing, she frantically searched the area before reporting her disappearance to the police at around 9 p.m. that night. Janet returned home in a state of panic, desperately hoping for news of her daughter's safety. Tragically, she would never receive such news. On the morning of September 12, 1988, Melissa's lifeless body was discovered in the old Boston and Main Railway Yard in Lawrence. She had been brutally stabbed to death, and her leg was amputated post-mortem when a train ran over her body. Detectives theorized that the killer had intentionally mutilated the body in an attempt to remove any potential physical evidence. The state police and Lawrence police launched an extensive investigation into Melissa's murder, thoroughly searching the railroad yard and other locations, including the Lancaster Grammar School, where Melissa was a student. The community was shocked and devastated by the heinous crime that had occurred in their small town. Leading the case was Lawrence police officer, Detective Thomas Murphy, who was appalled by the brutality of the murder, determined to bring justice for Melissa. Detective Murphy and his team collected physical evidence from the crime scene and the victim's body, although the specific nature of this evidence was never disclosed. However, the forensic team analyzing the body did determine that the stab wounds indicated the killer was left-handed. Since no arrests were made at the time, it is presumed that the evidence collected was not viable for the investigation leading to its shelving until forensic technology advanced enough to utilize it. The police interviewed numerous witnesses, suspects, and persons of interest, but the only lead they discovered was a suspicious-looking van in the vicinity of Melissa's location on the day of her murder. Unfortunately, further inquiries failed to yield any information about the van or its owner. Despite their exhaustive efforts, the police were unable to apprehend Melissa's killer, leaving the community in fear while her family and friends mourned their devastating loss. As time passed, no new leads emerged, and the case remained unsolved, eventually growing cold. However, in 2014, authorities decided to re-examine the cold case, led by Lieutenant Peter Sherver. After reviewing the old case files and the evidence left behind from the initial investigation, the detectives knew they had to take action. Several years later, the evidence recovered from Melissa's body was submitted for testing, and in 2022, after 33 years, the detectives finally had a suspect. On April 26, 2022, Marvin McClendon Jr., a 74-year-old former Massachusetts corrections officer, was arrested in his home in Bremen, Alabama by the Alabama State Police for Melissa's murder. Although the specific details of the evidence used to establish his guilt were not disclosed to the public, the press release did mention that the evidence recovered from the body played a crucial role in identifying him as a suspect. As detectives delved deeper into McClendon's life, a series of incriminating details came to light. McClendon, a former employee of the Massachusetts Department of Corrections, was not working for the state in 1988. He had worked for the department on three separate occasions between 1970 and 2002. However, during the time of the murder, he was involved in carpentry work in Chelmsford, a locality near Lawrence. 
Investigators discovered that McClendon had several connections to Lawrence, the nearby town where the young girl's lifeless body was found near a set of train tracks. Their investigation revealed that McClendon frequented various locations within Lawrence, including the Seventh-day Adventist Church on Salem Street. Additionally, he owned a van that resembled the one witnesses saw Melissa near on the day she disappeared. These findings shed light on McClendon's proximity to the murder location, prompting further inquiry into his potential involvement in the crime. In 1988, McClendon, then 41 years old, had gained a reputation for having an uncontrollable temper and displaying violent and aggressive behavior when under the influence of alcohol. He was known to frequently visit strip clubs, engaging in inappropriate and disrespectful activities towards women. Furthermore, he was involved in sexual relations with women in the back of his van, further tarnishing his image. These facts were previously presented in a court hearing by his brother, Strasnick. Mr. McClendon was represented by a court-appointed attorney, Mr. Fassold, during his trial following his arrest. However, during a hearing, a probation employee testified that Mr. McClendon did not meet the criteria for appointed counsel. During the hearing concerning Henry Fassold's motion to dismiss, McClendon's defense attorney, his own brother Strasnick, presented arguments against the motion. He provided evidence countering Fassold's claim that the DNA evidence collected was insufficient to support a first-degree murder indictment against McClendon. According to court documents, McClendon's lawyer highlighted that his client willingly provided a DNA sample to investigators during his initial interview with Lieutenant Peter Sherver of the Massachusetts State Police, which occurred in Alabama in 2021. Despite using a walker, McClendon managed to make his way into Salem Superior Court on Tuesday, where he sat beside his attorney, Fassold. In April 2022, during a subsequent interview conducted by authorities, McClendon vehemently denied any involvement in Melissa's tragic demise. He maintained his innocence and even suggested that he may have been the victim of a meticulously orchestrated plot by inmates from the Massachusetts Department of Corrections, where he had previously worked. This statement not only attempted to shift blame, but also aimed to mislead the authorities. Strasnick emphasized that the DNA evidence collected from the crime scene matched the DNA profile of a male relative of McClendon, making it highly unlikely that it belonged to anyone else. Furthermore, he argued that the DNA evidence was just one piece of the puzzle, as there were other factors supporting the indictment against his brother. McClendon's attempts to absolve himself of responsibility did not end there. He proceeded to shift blame onto his own brother, Strasnick, displaying a treacherous betrayal and a willingness to sacrifice anyone to protect himself. His efforts to portray his own relatives as the mastermind behind the crime revealed a great deal about his disloyalty and lack of trustworthiness. He vehemently disputed the notion that his brother was factually innocent, presenting evidence of McClendon's erratic behavior leading up to and following the murder, arguing that these actions indicated guilt. Additionally, he highlighted McClendon's history of violence, making him a plausible suspect in the murder case. Fassold's statement suggested that the investigation focused on McClendon rather than his family members due to specific evidence available at the time, such as McClendon's left-handedness, potential connections to Lawrence, ownership of a van in 1988, lifestyle, and interactions with law enforcement during the investigation. However, this explanation seemed suspicious, potentially serving as an effort to absolve Mr. McClendon of any wrongdoing and could be seen as a calculated and deceptive move. During the court proceedings, Judge Salim Tabit presided over a motion seeking to dismiss the case against the defendant, Mr. McClendon, who had been accused of first-degree murder. The judge attentively listened to the arguments presented in the motion and decided to carefully consider the matter before making a final decision. It is important to highlight that the charge of first-degree murder 
is an extremely serious offence, carrying the potential penalty of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Consequently, this case is being closely monitored by all parties involved, and the outcome of the upcoming hearing is expected to significantly impact the course of the trial. Despite Fassel's unsuccessful attempts to secure McClendon's release on a $50,000 bond, he remains detained without bond at Middleton Jail. Fassold also emphasized that there were no eyewitnesses to Tremblay's murder and no evidence suggesting that McClendon had any connection or motive to harm her. Nevertheless, McClendon is currently held in protective custody within a cell of Middleton Jail. As part of this confinement, he is only allowed to leave his cell when accompanied by a guard. This precautionary measure has been implemented to ensure McClendon's safety and the safety of others, considering the high-profile nature of the case and the potential risks associated with his involvement. By keeping him in protective custody, authorities can closely monitor his movements and interactions, thereby preventing any potential harm or disturbances within the jail or beyond. According to Sherry Carrigman, a friend of Melissa who attended McClendon's arraignment, she was merely ten years old when the crime took place. When she saw the defendant in court, she perceived him differently from what she had imagined. Melissa's family spokesperson, Danielle Root, conveyed that McClendon was described as an elderly and fragile individual. Shockingly, Melissa's lifeless body was discovered in a train yard in Lawrence on September 12, 1988, a day after she was reported missing. The family never anticipated that it would take over three decades for someone to be apprehended and brought to trial for Melissa's murder. Nevertheless, despite the lengthy delay, the family remains optimistic that the district attorney's office will exhibit the same level of commitment as the detectives who tirelessly pursue the suspect, Marvin McClendon. According to a statement, Root stated that there had been a lot of emotion since the end of April when they were informed of the arrest, ranging from excitement to sadness to frustration and all over the place. They were thrilled to see the suspect in jail, but also very saddened that some of their family members, such as their aunt, grandfather, and others were not alive to witness him facing justice. The statement went on to express gratitude to the police for their ongoing efforts throughout the years and for the use of DNA technology that was not originally available to work the case. Root finished by saying that their family was looking forward to the case, moving forward to the grand jury for indictment, and then on to the superior court to finally see justice served.